One of my earliest memories is how heavy the keys on a piano are. My mom and dad were incredibly involved in my early childhood learning and development, and like many first-time parents, buried themselves in reading material. And somewhere in there they found that learning a music instrument is correlated to higher intelligence. And that is how my toddler self ended up at his first lesson before he could even speak. <laughs> so over a decade later, when my early learnings in classical music had given way to a career in genetics, I was shocked to read a study of over 10,500 twins was unable to replicate this finding, meaning learning a musical instrument does not make you smarter. We seldom consider how much of the news that we read every day is actually founded in science. Headlines like, drinking coffee daily is making you tired, or eating yellow foods will make you happier, are all founded in research studies. From health and nutrition to business and marketing, the lifestyle decisions of millions around the world are dictated by science research. However, two studies published in 2016 and 2018 forever changed the field of social sciences research. In an analysis of over 1,000 studies, over 70% of the results were impossible to replicate. A fundamental principle of science research is that results can be reproduced. And the term came to define the scandal that rocked the community thereafter, known as the replication crisis. While many authors and scientists found their careers and ethos in question, others sought to define what the causes of the dilemma were. What explained why so many findings in so many different research fields were impossible to reproduce? While some studies in psychology demonstrated outright falsification of data or fraud, the majority could be attributed to what are known as QRPs, questionable research practices. QRPs are not intentionally fraudulent but involve capitalizing on the gray area of acceptable scientific practice, such as establishing statistical significance or vagueness of results in data. But what could possibly motivate literal thousands of scientists to participate in such behavior? The answer lies far from the lab bench and outside the field of research, and has a fatalistic nickname in academia, known as publish or perish. It describes the pressure on career track scientists to publish their findings year in and year out in prominent and competitive academic journals. Those who fail to sustain such an output struggle to secure tenure, funding, and other means of furthering their career. This is the first part of the problem. The incentives and rewards in science are fundamentally misaligned with the principles and goals of research. But the core of this issue actually lies in an age-old system of spreading scientific knowledge. In the 16th century, when Andrew Vesalius, father of modern anatomy, made his career under the patronage and support of Emperor Charles V, science was conducted in labs funded by patrons, staffed by apprentices, and scientists discussed and convened in exclusive lectures, talks, and publications. Today, much the same system lives on, but instead of patrons, we have grant foundations. Instead of apprentices, we have postdoctoral students. And many of the same conferences and journals live on very well, actually. Years of such outdated practices have perpetuated a closed-door, pay-to-play scientific community. And maintaining isolation and ignorance of cutting-edge research amongst the general populace has created a seemingly unbridgeable gap between scientists and the rest of the world. And in that sense, the blame doesn't rest solely on the shoulders of scientists. In fact, a study conducted by Pew Research found that the opinion gap between scientists and the public has widened more than ever before since the dawn of the 21st century. Areas of disagreement range from hot-button politicized topics such as GMOs and climate change to deeper questions like the implications and importance of the last decade in scientific discoveries. As an early career genetics researcher, I was always taken aback by the stark contrast and belief between those I worked with and popular media. At the time, the GMO controversy had just taken fire and was taking place in spirited debates around the world. But conversation in the lab remained much the same. We talked about sports, school, life. We almost dismissed genetic engineering as an inevitable sign of progress and a universal good. In reality, there are actually good points on both sides of the equation, but the area of greatest disagreement between scientists and the public, according to the Pew study, is actually the safety of genetically modified crops and organisms. On one side, GMOs actually offer 
a unique opportunity to solve world hunger and resource consumption problems. But on the other, they bear the real risks of damaging ecological diversity without proper regulation. But this discussion seldom, if ever, takes place in the public forum. And that is the second part of the problem. Those that constitute the flimsy connection between the jargon-filled academic journals where scientists convene and the everyday news that you and I read, namely science journalists. In the traditionally unremarkable and bland realm of science news, it can be incredibly enticing to publish polarizing headlines and exaggerate scientific results in order to garner the public's attention. The GMO opinion gap isn't alone. Consider the media's treatment of fracking, climate change, animal lab testing, anti-vaccination epidemics. Overzealous PR and marketing initiatives have permanently scarred effective dialogue regarding the broader corresponding issues, leaving only room for dichotomous positions on either side of the table and nothing in between. This further exacerbates an environment where free radicals are left to pioneer nascent and controversial fields with little ethical oversight or corroboration. Continuing on the topic of controversial science, a wholly new level of shock met the announcement earlier in 2018, late 2018 actually, at the International Summit for Human Genome Editing that Dr. Hei Jiankyu had created the world's first designer babies. The media reaction was to immediately label Dr. Hei as crazy and insane. The Guardian called the genetically modified babies an ethical horror, and The Verge hastened to label them as flawed. This is a, an exemplar of a core problem in science communication. When real research does manage to make the news, it's painted in a sensationalized and dramatized light. We've known that human genome editing was inevitable since 2012, when the first reports of mammal genome editing came out. But the media reaction was to stoke fears of a Gattaca-like future, rather than attempt to actually spawn productive dialogue. A useful conversation would entail discussing the merits of treating genetic abnormalities linked to diseases versus the dangers of optimizing for potentially favorable traits. That is, establishing what constitutes treatment versus enhancement. And this can be an equally thought-provoking conversation as ostentatious sensationalism. Consider, for instance, where on the ethical spectrum between treating a cancer gene or increasing IQ, if that were possible, would removing the gene for predisposition to alcoholism fall? The Public Library of Science's review of the designer babies put it best. Science journalists have an obligation to communicate responsibly. At this point, it should be abundantly clear that there is no single party responsible and no solution that will suffice for the gap in scientific opinion or the prevalence of scientific misinformation. But recanting thousands of studies doesn't merely waste research dollars and time. It affects the day-to-day -day lives of millions of everyday people. We base our decisions from what we eat and what we drink to how we work and raise children on these studies and findings. Fortunately, a group of pioneers and visionaries within the science community have some ideas that promise a brighter future for science. Firstly, open access. Open access is a global initiative for no paywall peer-reviewed journalism and conferences. By encouraging accessibility and transparency, open access hopes to eliminate the misal misaligned incentivization and lack of corroboration that old school publishing has prolonged. The Public Library of Sciences, a journal founded by several researchers dissatisfied with the status quo, proved that high quality academic publishing with peer review, open access, and fast turnarounds is possible. However, more controversial attempts to democratize access to cutting edge knowledge have been far rockier. Consider for instance the story of the young Aaron Swartz, co-creator of the RSS feed format and the Creative Commons organization. He attempted to put together a platform to share closed access papers for free, and was ultimately met with lawsuit threats that culminated in his death by suicide at just age 26. The story of the founder of SciHub, an incredibly popular site that now shares over 70 million articles for free, is very similar. She lives in hiding under threats from multiple multi-million dollar lawsuits and has been compared to Edward Snowden. Dismantling the monopoly that the five big publishing houses continue to wield on the cutting edge of knowledge is a work in progress, but the open access movement is a promising step forward, most notably in what is known as Plan S, a, consorti a consortium of European funders have established a mandate that any researcher that receives funding from these organizations must publish their work in an open access journal. However, merely opening the gates to academic research is not enough. 
Only a very small percentage of the world population has a time, interest, or experience to delve through pages of scientific jargon just to get the latest news. Joining the ranks of OA champions, several scientists have left the lab bench to launch new ventures aimed at translating scientific findings to broader audiences. Some rely on brevity and wit, such as Useful Science, a collection of one-sentence summaries of the latest research publications, or At Real Scientists, a Twitter account that's shared by a different researcher every week. Others, such as Draw Science's infographics or Latest Thinking's video summaries, use visual storytelling to translate the latest scientific findings to lay people audiences. However, perhaps the most important role played in this revolution is by those who aren't already part of the scientific community. For you, my ask is to challenge what you read. And that doesn't mean to inspire doubt in scientific news. Rather, take a critical and analytical approach to what you take in from scientific communities. Supporting, reading, and sharing some of the pioneer efforts mentioned earlier to bring the world closer to the lab bench is effective and twofold. One, it increases scientific knowledge and literacy, but also it increases legitimacy and recognition for non-traditional modes of communication within professional circles. For centuries before, the cutting edge of knowledge has been restricted to academic and scientific circles, and the result has been a yawning gap in opinion between those who do and don't have access. This difference in belief affects literally every facet of our lives, from what we consume to how we raise children, to how we treat environments, and how we treat diseases. Thanks to the accessibility and connectivity of the internet age, we have an opportunity to build a new scientific community that's more interesting, engaged, and informed. Thank you.